Hello, and welcome to my presentation, Teaching in the Time of Social Distancing, A New Normal, Challenges, Considerations, and Traits. My name is David Kent, and I am an Associate Professor and Head of the Tiso Mall Graduate Program at Wusong University, which is located in Daejeon, South Korea. If you have any questions about our program, give us a call, or any questions about this presentation, then feel free to send me an email. Of course, you're always welcome to drop by as well. So let me begin by saying that 2020 has certainly brought with it more challenges than normal for many educators. Primarily, the largest that many have confronted this year is the shift from face-to-face -face delivery of education to that provided and implemented via online means. This presentation will briefly highlight several of the challenges involved with this shift, along with implementation considerations when conducting synchronous online teaching, as well as some of the traits required by a successful online teacher. And these traits may soon be those that all educators will need to rely on, in which a new normal will likely see a time of social distancing, along with an expectation of an increased provision of synchronous and asynchronous online teaching to learners. Remote teaching is a term that is used by the British Council, among others, to refer to online teaching that is conducted synchronously, typically through video conferencing. And there are many ways to conduct remote teaching, but the most familiar to many instructors now, as a result of a rush to port offline classes to online ones, in response to the emergence of severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, is the use of teleconferencing software, such as Zoom. So teaching may be from your office, classroom, or home, and it may be into the student's home, classroom, or other places, sometimes even a parent's workplace. Synchronous online teaching is often supported by those methods and approaches typically used in a blended learning context, which are courses that involve the delivery of educational content and interaction from both the traditional face-to-face -face and the online learning space. Blended and remote teaching often includes extensive use of an Institutional Learner Management System, or LMS, and seeing students work on both asynchronous and synchronous computer-mediated communication tasks. It is also often combined with the integration of other media and print resources into lessons and homework, including various links to multimodal content, PDFs, websites, and WebQuest activities. Another point to consider with remote teaching concerns the early objective of the computer-assisted language learning field, which is a very interesting one, and that is normalization. In essence, the directive behind the implementation of call is to see its use become invisible, integrated seamlessly well into lessons in ways to assist learning that are essentially unnoticeable, just as a pen or a book might be used. The dynamics of online teaching can sometimes see us as educators come up against challenges and forget that what we simply do naturally in the face-to-face -face classroom may not be as naturally ported to an online context. So we often need reminding that aspects such as the nine that Stanley introduces us to are important to keep in mind when engaging in remote teaching. Challenges one and two are knowing the technology and being ready to troubleshoot it. When attempting to use technology seamlessly, you need to know it well and be ready to troubleshoot it as well as any problems your students may experience. Perhaps also, and something which I always advise, is to prepare a go-to contingency plan for any lesson, not just those involving technology. This is simply because you just never know what might go wrong and when you might need to adapt or change lessons due to unforeseen circumstances. With this in mind, the first lesson should likely always be spent on an attendance activity which will also serve to check learner microphones, cameras, and real name use. Aim for your lesson to go smoothly. Have all of your links and screens to share ready to go prior to the start of the lesson. Do not prepare these things during the online class session, as this will see learners sitting and waiting on you. If there are issues with anything, use a contingency breakout room with pair or group work and use that time to try and deal with it. Prepare students for malfunctions as well. They need to know that if you drop out of the room, 
they should wait for you to rejoin, and you might consider pre-assigning a class leader who is responsible enough to take control of any activities for a short time if this does occur. Other aspects to consider if the online session is dropping out is to temporarily use audio or text chat only, or even switch to another platform like Backchannel Chat or Kakao Talk. Challenges three and four are maintaining eye contact and ensuring screen presence. Perhaps the main challenge for remote teaching is in conquering the tyranny of physical distance and to create a learning space where that limitation is not a hindrance or a distraction in order to provide an educational context that is engaging and motivating for your learners. Establishing good teacher presence is one way to ensure this, and you can do this by maintaining eye contact. That is looking directly into the camera lens and not always looking towards the screen. This will help learners feel as though you are looking directly at them, and it provides a level of intimacy and personalization that may not be matched in a physical room with 40 other students and the educator at the board. Screen gaze may be a problem if you are using a tablet with the camera attached to the side of the device when in landscape mode, and not above the screen, which is the configuration of many notebooks. This then leads into the next point, that of ensuring screen presence. Always try to keep in mind how you present yourself on screen. If you choose to show yourself, then own it. Be professionally dressed and be fully visible, not just a part of your head. Face straight on rather than at an angle and think about illumination. Be sure that you are well lit, but that the light is not shining off you or that you are not sitting in the dark with only the screen illuminating your face. A good way to ensure this is to place a lamp behind the camera, either pointing down or up, but not directly at you, or to perhaps invest in a halo light. Challenge five is to be more than a talking head. An online lesson should be a memorable experience for students, just like any class, as relating content to meaning is one way for it to be remembered by learners. For this to happen, you must be more than a talking head, and there are a number of possibilities here. You might decide to stand up and move around, use props or realia, and do some of those things that you would normally do in a face-to-face -face classroom. You might also build in more pair and group work using breakout rooms and rely on the screen sharing of content and resources. Important here is to provide learners with an appropriate amount of student talk time with the focus on them and their use of the language, varying the activities that you provide and varying the ways in which you provide them. Challenge six is body language awareness. If you must be a talking head for part of the lesson or in the corner of the screen, then the body language that you present to learners will be very important to ensure that they are engaged and motivated. Ways of doing this are exaggerating your gestures and your facial expressions. And this is essential, especially if you're the size of a thumbnail on learners' devices. It's also important to understand that these exaggerations may appear huge to you, but on screen, they do appear to be much subtler. They add dynamism, and such mannerisms, along with good posture, also conveys confidence. Smiling is also significant, as it can show students that you are happy to see them, and a variety of facial expressions will, just like in the face-to-face -face classroom, capture student attention. Challenge seven is minimizing distractions. An important point of note here is that just as your screen presence is significant, students should preferably be visible to you so that you can identify them know that they are paying attention, and know that they are doing what is expected of them. One way to guarantee this is to ensure that all of your students' cameras are on and that they are using headphones. However, in some cases, bandwidth or the ability to purchase it could be a limitation, as could the ownership of an actual camera or the need to block online video with minors due to privacy laws. If the camera is turned on, you would be able to see if you have student focus or if they are distracted by someone in the kitchen who's cooking. By the same token, 
If learners are wearing headphones, then any background noise should be substantially minimized, particularly if someone is playing a console game in the living room behind them. Another issue here is, of course, the actual physical background itself, and that's if you have students who may be ashamed of their home environment. In this case, you may allow for the use of a virtual background, but a hazard here is that some learners may try to outsmart you by using a short video or GIF of themselves paying attention to you as their virtual background. Even so, if students are using their real names or a known nickname, then you are easily able to identify them and call on them appropriately, whether for official attendance reasons or to engage and actively involve them in the lesson. The use of a real name and being able to put a face to a name also helps learners get to know each other and to become familiar with their classmates before they are assigned to any pair or group work. Think about your own distractions as well, or those that you might present to learners. This is particularly true if you are working from home. Do attempt to ensure that no one will bomb your online lesson, virtually or physically, by using a virtual waiting room or simply by locking the door of the physical room that you're in. Also, consider you know, those other details, like the bookshelf behind you, the one that might have students attempting to read all of the book titles or staring at a trinket on the shelf. You might also want to limit the things that your learners can initiate in the online session and when they can engage with certain things and be mindful of the kind of links that you provide and when you provide them. This can also be valuable in terms of classroom management, taking away use of an interactive whiteboard, for example, or muting a student that might have a lot of background noise. Challenge eight is using the camera. So use the camera with other resources. For example, introduce props or realia when talking about vocabulary or eliciting. Having students respond in various ways, for example, via the chat box if they are all muted. Incorporate total physical response activities into lessons as well. For example, have students find some realia from within their own environment to show and to discuss later with others. In terms of teacher movement, if you have a still camera, you can roll your chair or body backwards or forwards to create a zoom effect. You can move in and out of frame to perhaps show charts or to incorporate the use of a portable whiteboard. For younger learners, puppets are very popular as well. And this, just as use of realia for adults, helps the learner relate to the material and in creating meaning. Additionally, you can screen share content with learners in ways that make lessons more interesting and to ensure that the lesson becomes a more multimodal experience than a face-to-face -face one. The risk here though is that you could end up screen sharing content that is copyright and being copyright aware is a trait that you will need to establish if continuing teaching in an online context. Power of camera use is also that of virtual backgrounds. And putting something behind you in a virtual background might be useful when changing the focus of a lesson. For example, a particular background for story time and another for review. The most versatile use in the teaching English to speakers of other languages context is the use of virtual backgrounds to set the stage for a discussion or the theme of a topic. For example, photographs that you've taken while on a tropical island if the unit is on travel, or a concert that you've attended if the unit is on entertainment. Virtual backgrounds can also be set to reflect the actual classroom of students, or be used to point to certain objects or things if you do not have the proper realia handy, or if it's too big or too heavy. This technique is also a useful way of introducing vocabulary for a topic, such as asking students what do you see in the background? Be mindful though, if you are showing text, then it needs to be large enough for students to be able to read, which might not be the case if you are using a worksheet for a particular activity and explaining to students how to complete it or eliciting their answers. The best way of ensuring that your virtual background appears well in applications such as Zoom is to overlay it on a green screen or by using a blank wall instead of one that might be cluttered and ensuring that any image that you choose is of a high resolution 
and 180 by 720 pixels. Aside from personalizing the lesson with your own virtual backgrounds, you may also like to ask students to change theirs, maybe to photographs that they've taken. In this case, you may need to provide a short tutorial video that explains how to set virtual backgrounds and house this on the institutional LMS for learners to access. It's also a good idea to make tutorials for students and parents or significant others regarding any common activity or task that you will have students complete for homework or later during online class sessions. This is so you can then focus on the completion of the task itself rather than the how-to behind it. The final challenge, and one of the most important components of remote teaching, is that of voice. And just as it's used in other digital contexts, like digital storytelling, in the online learning space, it's important to maintain a pace that is suitable to learners so that they can follow the lesson, comprehend what you are saying, and follow any instructions that you may provide. It's also important to try and engage learners by varying the volume of your speech, changing your tone, or using a higher or a lower pitch when speaking. Of course, a good quality microphone might also help you to sound better and come across with increased clarity. Yet the power of voice, sometimes overlooked by many teachers, is also important in helping to control aspects of classroom management in an online context. Especially with younger learners and particularly if the learner is sitting in a shared space with others as they can easily be distracted. Voice can also be used by you to pull the learner back into the lesson if their attention strays and used to convey different moods or emotions, especially when varying the tone of your voice. Now, taking those challenges into account, let's examine implementation considerations. So teaching face-to-face -face or online can be remarkably similar, but there may prove to be some aspects that you need to adjust to in an online environment. And these will likely be threefold and include aspects related to lesson planning, classroom management, including new ways of dealing with learners, and new considerations regarding the use of content. When considering the development of an online lesson, you might need to create a more involved kind of lesson plan, one where you specifically need to focus choice on the kinds of materials and resources that you will employ with learners and when you intend to employ them. These materials and resources will most certainly be different to what you may normally use in a face-to-face -face setting, and they might involve the use of more web links, screen sharing activities, and likely a much more involved use of the institutional LMS or the official website for any textbook that might be mandated. Just as you need to find those activities and that classroom management style that works for you in the face-to-face -face setting, you will also need to find it in the virtual space. And this works for learners too. The ways in which they now need to approach learning is very different. They will have their own set of challenges and they will need to develop a means of being able to cope and implement learning from an online space. And this is certainly something that you should also be considering. This might mean trying to ensure that a responsible adult is present with a young learner. It might also see you need to establish different levels of access for students and different means of involving and engaging learners with the content and resources that you now rely on. You also need to consider learner equipment as all learners will not have the same level of hardware. So you will need to teach to the lowest level. For example, do not provide links to videos in 8K as learners may not have the appropriate bandwidth to be able to download or stream these successfully. Part of taking learner privilege or lack of it into account is perhaps also allowing the use of virtual backgrounds by students. This option may prove important to those learners from a socioeconomic zone who may not want to turn on their camera if it shows others the kind of home in which they live. Also, as a teacher, you may not want to show the learners your home environment. Further, if teaching into a student's home, one important consideration is that of ensuring privacy and safeguarding levels of it for students. For example, 
Learner concerns about their face or video being captured and then used in deep fakes is perhaps very real for some. And one way of addressing that particular issue might be allowing those students to wear face masks at this time. The third consideration that we're looking at is content, and particularly how this relates to safeguarding, which is important. Just as you would not perform a Google image search in the classroom without safe image search set to on, you would not want to provide any links or screen share any content that is inappropriate or unprofessional. Further, you need to ensure that you have the appropriate license for any content that you do share, as some content that is permitted for classroom use over a projector may not be licensed to you as a teacher for online broadcasting. Now with that said, let's turn to the final section of the presentation, Educator Traits. Many of the traits that make a good online educator are those that also make for a good teacher, regardless of context. This includes several aspects covering self, content, and the learner. In terms of self, a great online teacher will be copyright, presence, relevance, and technology aware. This means that you use those resources that you have access to legally and professionally or request the necessary permissions required. You need to be mindful of how you present yourself to learners and ensure that this is also professional as well as in ways that engage and involve them in the material that you are presenting. This can be done by simply smiling, using a range of gestures, moving around and introducing additional content on screen. Most importantly, Use your voice to not only engage and involve learners, but as a classroom management tool to gain their attention and to provide content at a pace suitable for each class. Content can then become meaningful for learners, particularly if you are using eye contact methods over screen gaze, since you can appear to be addressing them personally and at an individual level. Of course, if you are enjoying the lesson, then this enthusiasm will transfer onto students as well. In other words, be confident and be in control. And this also means that you need to be relevance aware. Be mindful of student focus. Ensure that they are working on what they are supposed to be working on. For example, randomly check all breakout rooms for around half to one minute at a time whenever they are in use. Also, plan your lesson with not only the relevant content to use, but also the relevant time in which to use it. And check that this content can be applied in technology relevant ways. For example, think about screen sharing opportunities, link access, automatic grading of quizzes, the time that you need to spend in each breakout room and task suitability for pair or group collaboration or individual in session or homework use. In relation to this, you therefore need to be technology aware. Know the technology that you are using, know its limitations as well, and always be prepared with a backup or contingency plan ready to go, like an alternate activity or an alternate means of providing a synchronous online session. An additional aspect of being technology aware is ensuring that levels of privacy and safeguarding are in place for both the learner and yourself. For example, be aware that screen captures can be utilized in deepfake scenarios and any on-the-fly safe search off image searches might expose learners to very inappropriate content. Protecting those students on the wrong side of the digital divide is important as well, and you need to manage ways of providing a means of inclusion that is equal and fair for all learners, and this might mean the employment of virtual backgrounds and those activities suitable for low bandwidth or slow connections. Now, in terms of content delivery, a great online teacher needs to be emulous, flexible, preemptive, and resource ready. The most used resource in terms of emulation is that of video to emulate the physical presence of teachers and other learners. As a resource though, Video can be applied in both asynchronous and synchronous means, and you can use it to create tutorials and additional resources like in digital story creation, flipping the classroom, and so on. 
or even to explore new avenues with students by using it. For example, 30-second language point reminders for each stage of a lesson that either you or learners are tasked to create, or one dialogue posted to forums in the institutional LMS per class session by a pair or group of students. Housing such content on the institutional LMS is for learner review and perhaps also for formative assessment by you. Additionally, any instructions for language games or other activities or worksheets that you may constantly utilize can be made into short 30 second tutorials. This saves you repeating the instructions or steps involved in each instance providing you with more time to focus on learners. As a teacher in an online space, much like the offline context, you also need to be flexible in your delivery of content. And this means being ready to adapt the objectives of lessons to the characteristics of each class, learner culture, the age of learners, as well as being mindful of not only learner language needs, but their interests as well. You also need to be ready to deal with anything unexpected from troubleshooting issues or problems to activity failure and having a contingency plan ready to go. In this way, you can be preemptive and ambush the problems involved with teaching remotely by thinking of solutions ahead of time. This includes having a backup online space to continue lessons if the session is unexpectedly compromised or a class leader who is ready to take over activities for a short period of time if you drop out of a session unexpectedly. Part of this too is always being resource ready. Any physical props or realia that you might use need to be nearby so that you can easily bring them on screen as required. So too, all online content needs to be prepared and ready to go before a session begins so that you are not wasting learner time on preparation. Virtual backgrounds need to be sized and appropriate to learners and the lesson type, as do any multimodal resources with links fully functional and safe for learners to view, with all of these accessible from the institutional LMS so that every learner has constant access to them. In terms of the learner in online spaces, just like in the face-to-face -face classroom, we need to foster in our students levels of learner autonomy and independence and to help them to become collaborative learners who are engaged with content that supports lifelong language learning skills. Ways to do this include providing supportive learning content with tutorial videos that have been or that you have prepared for any common tasks that you will have students perform, as well as videos that might help learners troubleshoot any issues on their end. Solving such problems if they occur as well as using their initiative to become familiar with the how-to of activities prior to use, can support learners as both these instances essentially encourage independence and the learning of how to learn. In terms of language development, be supportive of this process by judiciously selecting resources that you know can positively impact student learning outcomes and rely on the hosting services of the workplace to house these. Also, promote out-of-synchronous online teaching session collaborative work, particularly of the type that can support the learner in terms of language engagement, like LMS use of asynchronous forum posts and responses, quiz completion, homework submissions. Aim to focus on collaborative activities and aim for increasing levels of student talk time over teacher talk time when using any online teaching tools. Ultimately, the more autonomous students can be in synchronous online teaching sessions in terms of their own learning, the more they will be able to take on offline. Increasing learner responsibility in turn will also see them develop the kinds of skills that are required of any lifelong language learner. In closing, the challenge now, or very soon, for many educators is in returning to face-to-face -face classes while practicing safe social distancing in a world where there will undoubtedly become new norms. Just as new norms materialized in the post 9-11 period, with the emergence of severe acute respiratory coronavirus too, many aspects of our lives have forever changed. This includes having to adapt to new teaching norms and perhaps also to arise in new expectations 
such as a permanent increase in the provision of synchronous and asynchronous online teaching. One thing that is certain though, as professional educators, we will all need to possess those traits that can see us successfully rise to meet such challenges by employing appropriate pedagogical methodology and in marching forward, implement any learning in positive and meaningful ways for our students. This now concludes my online presentation, but you may continue the conversation in the video comments and perhaps focus on these two questions. What do you find the most challenging when synchronously teaching online? And in what ways have you overcome these challenges? Perhaps setting rules for students was difficult, but you had parents help by sitting in on lessons. Or you might have had issues minimizing L1 or native language use in breakout rooms when teaching languages and so decided to try and implement some face-to-face -face monitoring techniques by setting a specific amount of time in each breakout room by activities. Let us know. Thank you for listening all the way through. I trust that you'll be taking away something of interest and value, and hopefully something that you can practically use. Thank you again.